Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, Ahmar for coming today, Sultan for coming today as well. What is this? So I want to explain a little bit about the audience, what this is. Some people in the past know me uh, when I was in the uh, graduate school, uh, my PhD, I did a little project uh, for a um, um, podcast called Chasing Encounters. And the idea of the podcast was to talk about with people in the podcast, to talk about research, to talk about culture, to go talk about languages, etc. So because I finished the PhD, so obviously that project, I just decided to finish it and wrap it up and move on into new ventures. And now that I am um, assistant professor here at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland, so I ask myself what would be the best way to continue in such uh, an approach to engaging with public, uh, ac 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 academic, well, with the academic world publicly, but also having discussions that are meaningful to us <clears throat> as researchers, educators, etc but also in a way that is not as rigid and dry as a presentation, in a, you know, in a, like we're doing uh, conferences or seminars, et cetera, but more like in the lines of let's sit down with a few friends or colleagues uh, to discuss an issue that is important for us. So that's why we are here today. So to try this new approach, this is a live stream. Some people call it a webinar. Some me, other people call call it um, vid, vidcast as a video cast. So however we can call it. I mean, we don't have necessarily to name it or put boundaries to this. But I call it capsule capsulex, which is capsulas in Spanish and capsules in English. And what this means is <laughs> the idea that uh, in these engagements that I hope to do over the few months or years or whatever this takes is the idea that we're taking some pills or drops of knowledge or ideas that could help us grow and nurture ourselves and build our knowledge and help us to grow and be strong academically but also personally but also uh, as humans so that's what capsulas means so the idea of a uh, little drops or of pills not in the medicinal uh, big pharma thing but more is in the idea of knowledges that could come in little pills and then we take them and then we nurture, help ourselves as well. So that's the idea of capsulas, right? And um, I decided to invite um, Ahmad and Sultan to this talk because, well, I know them for, uh, because of their past uh, British uh, Applied Linguistics Conference last year and then we engage in conversations and uh, we have had different types of conversations and I decided to, what a great idea to invite them for this new initiative that I have and they they accepted. I'm happy that they accepted because, uh, to be honest, this is the first time that I do this live chat. Um, and then we have on the live chat we have the language center at Queens. This is great. We we have uh, also Donna Hart uh, with us. So that's the other thing that I wanted to do. This I wanted to do this something that is live and interactive that people can come and ask questions or say hi. Whatever you want to do, we'll be looking at the chat or monitoring the chat for questions. So that's a good idea um, uh, for us to keep doing. So that's the general idea about uh, what we are expecting to do. Uh, and then now moving in into the topic for today, um, as some of you, uh, Akmar and Sultan, and some of the people who are viewing today. Really quick, last year at the uh, around November, uh, we were all involved and bombarded by what something that had happened for a long time: AI technology, aka ChatGPT, and a lot of people have been using it, and a lot of people have been having lots of different comments, positive and negative as well. And we, as educators uh, and researchers uh, in applied linguistics and language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, well, we, we sort of uh, are preoccupied about this, but this is nothing new in the past. Like AI technology was nothing that just happened like two, three months ago. This has been happening for a long time and it has been in the back of our minds for a long time as well. It's not until now that people are being concerned. And we're gonna be talking about this um, um, today in, in our sort of chat today. And that's why, uh, I said, okay, so this is pretty new to me and it's pretty new to Ahmar and Sultan and a lot of folks out there, especially teachers, 
uh, who are new to technology. So this, this, so I decided let's talk about this from the point of view of a person or people who don't know much about. It. I mean, I don't know much about technology. The regular turn on, turn off the computer and the phone and the tablet mainly, but but because this is something that is little by little trickling in. Um, we don't know much about it, but we should talk about it and get start the conversation. So that's why I invited both of you uh, for this conversation. So let me introduce them and then we get started. So first of all, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Sultan. Uh, Sultan Turkan has been serving as a lecturer in bilingual education here at Queen's University Belfast since 2020. Prior to joining Queen's uh, University Belfast, Sultan worked almost a decade as a, as a research scientist at Educational Testing Services, ETS, investigating sources of bias in mathematics and science assessment. Across those years, Sultan became increasingly more resolute in her work to innovate ways to provide opportunities for immigrant children to demonstrate their linguistic and cultural resources in mainstream classrooms. So since joining uh, Queen's University Belfast, Sultan chair the 2022 Baal Conference at, uh, here at the university. And recently she has been appointed as the Northern Ireland convener of the teacher education special interest group for the British Educational Research Association. And finally, central to Sultan's work is a strong commitment and dedication, of course, to social justice by accompanying immigrant children and their teachers in their social cultural journeys in and out of the schools. That was a short, a short bio from Sultan, but now for Ahmar, Makbu is also known as Prof. Nomad and Sonny Boy Brumby has been working at the University of Sydney since 2004. Ahmar is keenly interested in the application of social semantics in the real world context in pursuing this goal, Agmar draws from and contributes to the range of disciplines, traditions, theories, and methodologies. Agmar uh, is twice recipient of the President of Pakistan's Award of Highly Qualified Overseas Pakistanis. And in 2019, Agmar was recognized as the field leader in English language and literature by the Australian magazine. And in 2021, Sonny Boy's poetry was inducted into the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. So as you can imagine, we may not be experts in AI technology, but we are experts in many other things, but we are concerned and we would like to have a chat today precisely about um, AI and the, the effects of AI technology in our um, work. So I wanna start with one question to each one of you. And the question is, what do you understand by artificial intelligence? What is in the back of your mind? What comes to your mind when you hear the word AI, artificial intelligence? Uh, for me, of course, it's a movie out there. It's a, it's a movie that I remember watching a few movies, you know, that you have this robot that is sort of mimicking the human things. And then that's what comes to my mind. But um, I, I can talk for hours about it, but that's not necessarily my time. I want to hear you. So I'm going to start with uh, Ahmar. What do you, uh, what comes to your mind when you hear the word AI or artificial intelligence? I'll be honest, for a very long time, I didn't really care uh, because I knew it was technology that was happening at the back end. They were using it for various softwares. They were using it for various different things. I knew it existed, but it wasn't really in, in my space as an educator or as a researcher. But I think chat GPT really changed that. Um, and the discussions around its, its involvement, for, for example, with plagiarism, in terms of relation to possibilities of pedagogy, it sort of changed the way that I sort of started to think around it because now I'm sort of concerned and very much in thinking around how do I engage with it within my own educational and research contexts to be able to uh, use it in appropriate ways and also to enable my students and my colleagues to be able to use it in ways that will make them competitive. Because you know, if we don't, then we'll be replaced by machines. So we have to have that added, added sort of value to what we have been, you know, what we can bring to the table, something that is more than just what AI can do. So thinking about how to do that and where, what's the best sort of methodologies around that. 
So just a follow up to you, Akmar. So you're, you're, you're meaning that we should see AI knowledge as like we should pursue AI technology as an asset, like as a kind of literacy, like we need to know this as soon as we can because otherwise we're gonna be relegated to the past. Is something around those lines? Well, think about it this way. <clears throat> if our students are uh, still doing the old kind of assignments that AI can now do for them, then who will employ them? So we have to think about how to create the possibilities that our students are going to be of uh, value to the industry and to they will be able to secure good jobs and make a living for themselves. And in a world where the technology already exists, it's not a question of we can't, can, we, can we reject it, it exists. So the question then becomes, how do we best use it as a, as a tool for ourselves and our students? Good, thank you so much. So it's a tool that we need to use and then we need to learn because it's here and then we need to learn how to use it because otherwise we don't know what's gonna happen. Thank you, Ahmar. Now, uh, Sultan, what comes to your mind when you hear the word artificial intelligence? What, what, are, what were your initial thoughts about it? So um, I think it really takes me back to my days at educational testing service where I was working um, um, with a bunch of um, natural language processing uh, scientists. So we would call them NLP scientists. And um, at the time, I was curious um, about what they were doing. And obviously, because there was a lot of research around human, um, human scored essays and automated scores essays or mach machine scored essays. And I was, I was to the best of my, I guess, um, knowledge and, and, and background, because my knowledge, my, my background is very much um, in language education and um, English, uh, you know, teaching English as a foreign language, applied linguistics and teacher education. So this was quite new to me. Um, <clears throat> through um, reflecting back those days, really, I, I mean, I didn't know at the time um, that that the natural language processing, and obviously I'm looking at it from a language education perspective. So when I hear the word AI, for me, it's it's really about you know it's really rooted in in cop, um, 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 corpus linguistics, um, natural language processing, and 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 the big data now right this sort of a mining of the data da of data that we 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 each as human beings put out there and then these these sort of ultimately corpus linguistics based algorithms are making sense of of the language um, patterns that we put out there and then and then and then these these patterns then are fed fed into a a technology or this kind of product called chat gpt and so now um i haven't really used chat gpt i mean i have um really seen it and and kind of experienced it through you yes it um and um, and I imagine, uh, like like Ahmar, uh, I imagine our students. Uh, I am teaching at at a an, um, uh, master's um, level um, program, and uh, our students are already using it in their you know um, submission of assignments and so on. Um, yes, I do agree with the sentiment that this is a movement that is um you know that's gonna snowball into into big bigger avalanches and um we need to yeah i guess we need to we need to understand first of all when we first uh, had the conversation the three of us i said well i don't really understand it fully you know to be able to make any judgment of it but but that's the point. We need to really fully understand how um, it works and 
and the algorithms are, are built um, and not necessarily from a computer science like technological perspective, but like how 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 does it how does it operate? How does it uh, how, how does it how does it get served to us, you know, uh, as an interface and then um, and be we, we should be able to um, then um, kind of come to a fluid place where we can go in and out of, um, you know, AI spaces, right? So, so like, I agree with Ahmar that so that we are, our jobs do not become <laughs> redundant or we are not, <laughs> we are not made redundant, right? Um, but it's not about job security or anything. It's really about um, ensuring um, how our students are engaged uh, with, with, um, you know, uh, with, with, with uses of language that are authentic, you know, um, um, that are rooted in real life, um, yet also, um, yet also their uses of language that are rooted in imagination, you know. Um, so, um, so that's that's where I where I am with it, with this. Yes, thank you so much, both of you, for sort of getting us started uh, about this topic and your initial responses to this topic. And a couple of things that I want that I have picked up from what Sultan has said is the questions that comes behind using such technologies in education. And it is, as a, as a critical scholar, we have to ask them, why is this happening at this particular time? And what is behind all of this infrastructure, interface, as you said, how is that really operates? And one big question is, you mentioned the idea of big data, right? And the idea that, are these companies collecting data the way Facebook, Instagram has been doing for a long time? And if yes, do we know this? And if not, how are we? How are they doing this? Like we need more answers to all of these questions, right? Because it, we we cannot only just go there, click the button, and start using all of these things, thinking that everything's going to be fine. It's important to understand to ask these questions, and we know as critical educators that we need to ask these critical questions before actually try or, or while we are consuming, not before consuming, but as we are consuming is asking questions, but I am asking this question, how is this able to do that question? And we're gonna go in more details in a moment for that because I agree with what Sultan has said. Another question is, that got me thinking is the idea of languages and languages in real life, right? Does this mean that, that the languages, that what, what is happening out there in our communities what are they gonna disappear in 50, 100 years just because now everything is done through AI technology? Yes or no? I mean, we don't know yet. But one thing that is interesting about ChatGPT that I have done it and a few folks have done it is ChatGPT, you can start asking your question in English. The machine answers in English. You can ask the question in my case in Spanish and the machine continues responding to me in Spanish and you can use another language and, and, and then continue responding. So it's like, oh my God, so now you're learning. Now you're becoming bilingual, multilingual, trilingual, whatever. And I wonder, so there's so some, even some of my students said, so I guess we're not gonna need English teachers anymore or language teachers for that matter anymore because the machine will, an, will, will answer all our questions in any language, so what's the point? So, because of that, I think we need to start thinking about the role of the educator. Is it the role of passing on the information, you know, like Paulo Freire a long time ago said, you know, empty vessels here, you don't, you don't know here, now you know, or, or the role of the teacher or the educator is more about engaging our students with such technologies in a way that uh, contributes to society. So that being said, I have a video to show you both and our audience for us to see what a teacher has to say about this or has done. And then after that, I want to hear your comments or reflections on that video, your thoughts, your ideas, and reactions to the video. So let me 
try to bring the video is gonna take me a second. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. So um, here is the video. Oh, hold on. Stop the video again. Cause now I think it looks like I need to <coughs> share the sound. Share the sound, share the video. Here we go. And please let me know, Ahmad or Sultan, whether you're listening or not, because sometimes, you know, things happen. Here we go. So it's been three weeks since I made my first post about the AI bot and how I plan to use it in my classroom. And since then, I've acquired many new followers, and I got interviewed by Wired Magazine over this whole thing. So I thought it was probably time to update you on where my head's at and how I plan to do this. Here we go! As of now, I still am standing on the hill that I truly believe we should use these AI bots specifically for writing as a tool, just like calculators were to math, rather than something that kids see as a cheater way out. But that's going to be incumbent upon the developers and the teachers and curriculum writers to figure out how that works. And we're not going to see any of that for some time. So here's my quick and fast lesson plan. I've been working only on developing this with my senior AP literature class as of late, but I do plan on adapting it for lower grades eventually. But I'm not there yet, so calm down. So I took into consideration the thousands of comments on the last post regarding this. And I understand people's concerns, and I think I've addressed a number of them. First, students are expected to read a novel and come to class with a very solid knowledge of that book. Just like the good old days. Secondly, they will be given a prompt by which they will develop their own thesis statement in class with me with no computers. The goal is to not only make a very precise thesis statement, but actually couple that with a request for the AI bot to write this essay. And the more precise they are, the better off they will be. They will give those to me and I will generate all of those essays using the AI bot. The next day, they will come to class and using pen and paper, not computers, I will hand them the essays that the bot generated for them, the one they generated based on their individual thesis statement. And they will be given a graphic organizer and asked to deconstruct what happened. So here is the graphic organizer. Pause to take a look at it. It breaks it down piece by piece as to my expectations for these essays and for exactly what I would expect to see in it. Students will be expected to use the essay that the bot generated and this graphic organizer, take apart the essay and put it in the graphic organizer without using a computer, just by hand right now. That's day one. I'm going to give them a whole period to just do that much. Day two, they're going to have turned all that in at the end of the period. They don't get to take it home with them and they don't have access to the original essay because I was the one that generated it. So on day two, they'll come in and I'm going to ask them to take a single internal paragraph and improve it. And they will have a choice to either improve it on their own or try to use the bot to make it better. But they're going to have to know what needs to be better to do either of those things. And thus, the bot becomes a tool for us to be better writers. I hope. I'll get back to you on how this goes. The land of experimentation right now. And again, tell me where I'm going to screw this up. All right, this is a very interesting um, video from our uh, educator who engaged in uh, ChatGPT and other AI bots to engage their students into some kind of academic or, or, or writing in general. So now we're gonna move into your reactions, uh, Akmar and Sultan, but before doing that, a couple of things that I wanted to say, like a story, I always like to uh, uh, start my conversations with a little story. Back in the day, long time ago, long, long, long time ago, the literature teacher, you know, the Spanish literature teacher, asked us to read, I don't know how to say this in English, Don Quixote de la Mancha. I don't know, how, how do you say that in Don English? Quixote. Well, I'm going to say it in Spanish, but folks out there know Don Quixote de la Mancha, which is a very famous mm -hmm. Spanish book. So, of course, we need to read this book, which is like this thick, and I am like, what, like 12, 13 years old, and... I was like, do I have to read this? And then I was asked to write a report on the book, like a page or something and two pages. And obviously a lot of people, what they do is they read the book, they take whatever, a week or two weeks, whatever is necessary. And then they, they at that time, believe it or not, a typewriter, haha, -ha, I am that old. A typewriter, <laughs> write a report. However, because, 
I could not do that homework for other reasons. So what I did at that time, there was this uh, person outside the, the school who would sell the summaries of all the famous books, like 100 Years of Solitude, you know, Shakespeare, all of those. So they would sell like a little booklet with the summaries of these books. So obviously you go there, buy the little booklet, then come back. And then I went back home and just, just recopy at the time, not photocopies or, you know, like these things. I, I would type whatever it was in the little booklet whatever it was there and then hand it in to the teacher. So it reminded me a little bit of the chat GPT is just like 30 years after it's the same idea. Like you have a task to do and then you have to do a report. So imagine when I was watching this video and then all the videos that I have seen on chat GPT is the task itself has not changed. Read the book, write a report. So it got me thinking, why is it that I, at that time, I was not able to do that? It was because of lack of engagement. I was not engaged in, in, in the activity, just read a book, write a report. And for this person who tried to do the activity, obviously you can see now is using a way, using AI to engage their students into a new technology that is scary for a lot of us, but at least change the, the goal of the task, which is not only read, report, but read and you know do something with all of this by using AI. So I'm gonna stop for a second and I want to hear your thoughts on and what the person said on the video and your experience and your thoughts. I don't know who wants to jump in and say something. Can I just start with um, yes. maybe a reaction to the classroom task. So um, I guess I guess I as a as a teacher I am very much conditioned and um, yeah conditioned and programmed to look at okay what is the pedagogical task that she's talking about in the video. And for me the 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 complexity of the task seems to be at the deconstructing level. So in other words, she's using a model essay to deconstruct, you know, um, um, well, effective traits of an effective, or let's say traits of effective argumentative essay, right? So then deconstructing is how, so the first question I have, the, re, the first reaction I have is how complex and how deep is, is that, you know? It's staying at the deconstruction level, which we know is at the level of pretty much knowledge and recognition and and, uh, and 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 noticing it's not necessarily maybe going into the earlier you know stages of analysis but it's not going into the level of synthesis and you know evaluation and and the the higher level um, uh, uh, higher level thinking skills so the other reaction I have to this is, um, around, um, essentially content, meaning making, you know, I heard her talk about stylistic concerns around, around an effective argumentative essay, you know, um, in the, in the graphic organizer, I saw some you know, quotes and evidence and and claim and so on. But but it didn't get give me a, a window um, into her thinking around how she would engage. And when I say engage, engagement is a big task of teaching, you know. How do I engage students in meaning making? around this this novel i didn't hear her touch upon that you know um so 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 then of course as a as an educator as someone who you know really even my 
uh, high school was a teacher training high school. I, I'm just sort of so conditioned and programmed around, okay, well, what, 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 how are we like, how are we really engaging with students? What are they engaging with? Are they just engaging with this, you know, this cool looking new uh, hip um, device? Oh, it's called bot. And then, oh, they, I go in, log in. I just, I know how to use it. It spits out something for me that makes my, my job easier in, in the literature class. Is it that surface level of engagement or is it this kind of really, you know, deep, deep, um, co complex cognitive engagement that 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 she's hoping to to um, uh, to create around this? My my answer from this very short video, from what I watched in this very short video, is 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 that it's rather limited. Again, it's. For me as a language educator, it's all about meaning making. What meaning were the students engaged in? How are they engaged in, in it? Are they just stuck at the deconstruction level? If so, how is the teacher, you know, moving them from deconstruction to more of like owners and producers and, you know, evaluators and creators level? I guess I said a lot, yeah. That's fine. I think we need that. Be actually, we are engaging with the with the with the with the conversation now. That's what we are we're expected to do. So, how about you, Ahmar? Any thoughts? Yeah, like maybe I just pick pick up on a few threads that Sultan sort of mentioned. Um, yeah, I noticed the deconstruction stage is there too. Very strong on deconstruction. At the point, at the same point, I think that she was sort of moving toward joint construction. So her later sort of activities were sort of getting the computer and the, so the bot and the students sort of working together to jointly sort of construct some text. So I, I did see a bit of movement toward joint construction. Now, we do need to notice that here that uh, chat GPT is about what it produces in a written text. So what the teacher excluded from, from the whole discussion was the reading, right? So a lot of things that Sultan you're sort of talking about is reading. I mean, the teacher said, oh, this student had to read the novel. Yes, but do they know how to read the novel? Uh, you know, how, do they know how to critically engage with the reading of a novel, right? So where is the pedagogy behind the reading element? So it's, in a sense, it seems like the students do the reading themselves, which creates an assumption that they can do the reading themselves. And then yes, we're bringing them in and then we're going to teach them the genre. And then we're going to do the deconstruction and they will do the joint construction. And perhaps at a later stage, the students will have to do some kind of independent construction sort of a thing. But mm -hmm. all of that cannot really happen without good reading. Yes. And right. So I was looking at the absence of reading. And that's, I think, is a, is a is sort of a thing that I've noticed in, in discussions around GPT is the absence of discussion around reading. Right, so who is teaching them how to read? This is all about writing. So of course, we're assessing the students on writing. So writing becomes a sort of primary focus for teachers and others to sort of get concerned around because we are using writing to evaluate them. But yes. that writing cannot actually happen in the absence of reading. So what are we doing about the reading bit? How do we use AI technology to help these students to learn to read? I mean, chat GPT can't really do that. It's not designed to, it's a writing talks. It's like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't do images. You can convert what it says into images through other AI software, but it mm -hmm. doesn't it, it do it itself, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily do the listening bit. So you have to type in the prompts. You can't mm -hmm. at the moment just speak a prompt and have a conversation. Again, that's something that might happen later, but uh, can chat GPT teach a student how to read? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you guys, uh, are, yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah. might know. Chat GPT is a tool; it's not a teacher, right? That's 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 the first thing that we yeah. need to understand. Chat the ball yeah. AI technology is not the teacher. We are the teachers. People out there are yes. the teachers. A yes. Chat GPT is a tool that can use for many things, like any tool, like the typewriter is a tool to write, etc., etc., etc. One thing yeah. that I wanted to mention before Sultan want to say something is two things. 
one it's important to understand that i don't want to i don't want to point out at the teacher and say hey you're not doing your right the right thing to do you are not you, you know i don't want to point fingers into the teachers at this point uh, especially in this, this particular video because she did say i would this is for my advanced class so it's under the assumptions they already know how to some way of uh, doing the reading. They have done lots of work on reading. So I don't I don't want to go into the assumption that this teacher is a bad teacher and doesn't uh, know how yeah. to engage students into, into knowing how to read. That's the number one thing. The second thing is we also need to question what do we mean by reading? What if reading is, is, is taking this paper and read or reading as in, as, as in a critically reading? Because there are also there are blind people who don't know how to read the way we read, right? So we need to also question that we read, what we be by reading, engagement with reading, especially. And the last thing is um, um, how do we engage students in general with some type of a literacy or reading in different ways, multimodal ways? And I know the video that I showed you is just like little tiny, tiny example of what people are trying to do that now to catch up with, oh my God, it's still, like, what should I do? So this is just one of the many examples that are out there that people can do. And I want to jump in really quick because in the chat where the language center here at the university says, maybe encouraging the use of chat GPT to prepare for in-class discussions on a book is a great idea. But as Sultan says, in-class discussion is sharing chat GPT ideas not right, not a right at through engagement. So you're right, like it's a tool that needs to, we need to learn how to go about this tool, whether we use it or not, or how we use it, how we advance our things, that's the key thing. But before moving into the last, the, the next section of our discussion today, I know Sultan wanted to say something, a follow up, yeah. and I wanted to make sure to give you a voice. Yeah, uh, thank you, Yesid. Yeah, no, I just wanted to um, pick up on Omar's points uh, and, and maybe just problematize a few, few questions for us. One is, where is multimodality? I mean, what, what, what I mean, um, there's all these, this in the, uh, increasing scholarship around multimodality and, and, and so on. And, and a tool uh, as popular as this one, like ChatGPT, or or maybe another another permutation of it, that will come in in the near future. You know, um, uh, what is the the theory of language that the the tools as such, you know, are promoting? Language is not just written text, you know. We all, the three of us, um, and all our colleagues at QB and University of Sydney, you know, like um, we we taught languages. <laughs> we really just sort of uh, taught the this, this, this kind of maybe hammered on this idea of integrated skills and so on. <laughs> you know, the the good old integrated skill. Um, uh, approach it still kind of holds you know you, you need to have you need to interpret something deeply in order before or in order to um you know produce ideas about it and 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 that i that that question that you see you also brought up you know like what 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 is reading what is reading really well how are we in what 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 definition or representation of reading is chat is something like chat gpt promoting right so these are no, all would, <laughs> yeah i'll just probably extend on what you're saying sultan uh, and i think this is something that sort of worries me around it because the epistemologies of knowledge that chat gpt seems to be drawing on and reinforcing mm -hmm. are the ones that are are dominant in a certain sort of a culture mm -hmm. so you know, part of our academic knowledge building and the kind of work we do is questioning the epistemologies, questioning the ways that knowledge is created, questioning yeah. the categorization of knowledge in certain ways, questioning the division between oral language and written language and multimodality. So we're sort of doing all of that stuff, but then ChatGPT comes along and it sort of reduces all of that complexity yes. into something that is given down as a little text. 
And you know, I think I shared this example with you earlier because I've been playing around with it, this technology. So you know, one of the epistemologies that I'm always worried around is how do we define life, right? So you know, there are certain ways in which people define life, and they just accept it, that sort of epistemology. Now there are these things called trovants, which are rocks that can reproduce, and reproduction is, is a feature of life. And yet we see rocks as being non life, right? They're not alive. We see them as not being alive. But there we have an, an example of a rock that can reproduce. So it does have features of life. So I just played around with ChatGPT and maybe people watching you know, now or watching who are going to watch later, just do a bit of research. You know, trovents, which are roundish sort of rocks found around Romania, they can reproduce. And if you play around with GPT, GPT keeps reinforcing the etymologies and the ways in which science divides life and non-life without really engaging with the problems that, that we are sort of raising. So that's part of, you know, just what as you said, part of my worry is, are we going to, through use of our students using this technology, will that potentially reinforce certain sort of ways of doing work? Uh, and, and that again goes to the notion of criticality and things because then we are sort of the students are going to lose that criticality because they're essentially being being given these these models which are already have already determined what the nature of reality is and using that to create what they're doing what you know gpt does so i'm just sort of you know worried around these sort of questions of 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 how uh, AI technology, again, things will change. I know this is, you know, one of the first tools. There are other tools coming in. So how will that all be managed? I I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much uh, for bringing that up. We're going to be co continuing this uh, engagement and conversation because uh, we're going to move on into our next part of uh, our capsules today, which is I'm going to share the screen in a moment. And I'm gonna show you different um, how or the possibilities for different AI uh, technologies in the world that students are using right now. And after I show you different ways, um, we can we can discuss a little bit more in depth about it and then uh, we wrap up. So let me try to share my screen again. Here it is, you let me know with a thumbs up again if you see the screen or not. Are you seeing the screen now? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we are on the on the front screen of ChatGPT, and this is what we encounter. You have uh, the search bar at the bottom where you can write your question, your prompt, uh, however you want to call it. You can ask a question. You can prompt the the bot to do whatever they want. So if I don't know about this and I have an assignment, so I come to ChatGPT and I say, can you write a brief summary of El Quixote de la Mancha. And because I, I am a very decent person, I say please, even to the chat bot. So let's see what the what the chat bot uh, is gonna give us. So there it is. So it's, 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 it's giving us a brief. It takes a few seconds to giving us the, the summary. So as you can imagine, if you give this homework to students, so the student now not anymore does have to read the text or the, 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 the piece of literature because you have the summary here. And then the next day, you just print it out and give it to your professor. There you go. So Don Quixote de la Mancha is a classic novel written by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra in the early blah, blah, blah. So you get it there. So you get your homework, right? And I know you can do many other things. Um, like, for example, you can ask, what is critical theory, for example, right? Let me see, critical. And if the body's telling me, oh, you haven't written well critical theory, well, you have to spell it better. Here you go. Here is how you should do it. And then what is critical theory? And then the body's going to tell me what is critical theory. So it's telling me, oh, critical theory is this, or agent in Frankfurt, blah, 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 which seeks to analyze the child. Okay, well, this is interesting. And then it's gonna take a minute or so to tell me what critical theory is, right? And then it's gonna take a moment, you will see. 
But then as you go and see, you say, okay, so there you go. So now I don't have to go to the library and find out. But then the question is about plagiarism and say, okay, but then uh, of course there are no sources in here. So that's plagiarism. So that's, I tell the chat bot and say, hey, can you provide references for what you stated above? And again, the chatbot is telling me, hey, listen, buddy, you you know you, you misspell this thing. So I use it again. And then I ask the chatbot, can you provide reference for what you state above? And then it's gonna take a moment and probably it's gonna have go to the library and then see it says, sure, here are a few references for the definition of critical theory. And then it tells you some uh, whatever, some uh, yeah. like that. Annotated bibliography. Exactly, like bibliography. And I guess I can go to the, the library now and go in person and pick up the book of the Oxford Handbook of Critical Theory, or I can pick up the book uh, by Stephen Eric Brunner, or I can go and pick up the essays from Mark Horkheimer, or I can go and keep it. Go, like, what else? Okay, so I can do that. Or, I can or, also... or, or you can just insert after every other sentence, you can insert one of these references it, as if you exactly. actually to show then as I if, say, as can if you, you read them and you, briefly, you are citing from them. Can you briefly explain what, uh, for example, Max Hork Hork Hey, Mark can you briefly explain what Mark has said about critical theory, please? And the chatbot is going to explain to me. Okay, the guy said specifically this. Mm -hmm. Right. So just it takes a second because uh, the guy obviously has to be thinking a little bit. Um, and as we're we're waiting, this is what most of the students are perhaps doing now and this is what it's a threat to google now because google google hasn't said anything about this yet because a lot of folks out there are saying what if what if this is the new google and then people don't use google but they use this thing so so see mark now is explaining what this is uh, according to max horton hybrid right so again you don't have to look up for this information. It's just out there, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, the information is right there, so students don't even have to uh, do that anymore. So, it's, yeah. and you can also tell the bot how long you want this to be, like a one thousand word paragraph, two thousand word paragraph, or something like that. Like it, you can be it, now. We're talking about prompts, so you prompt the child whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, now the last the last thing that I want to do is, can you connect this theory to the theory of, let's say, um, to the idea critical the, race theory. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. And the guy is going to connect both things. So whatever we ask our students, uh, we did it in like in three minutes. So, I mean, at this point, I don't have much comments about this, uh, but this is more or less what the guys are. The guys doing critical risk theory is a contemporary intellectual. Da, da, da. And you keep prompting the chat box to give you all of this information. But because of plagiarism, we ask the students always, you need, you need to uh, cite, you need to reference, right? And uh, well, it's gonna give you the reference. If you ask them to give you the reference, it's gonna give you the reference. But now it's it's it's, it's uh, connecting. Look, like critical theory, uh, CRT analyze and challenge the society and the structure. So he's, he's doing that, and he's even doing the conclusion. While critical theory provides a broad framework for the criti critique of social cultural structures, CRT applies these frameworks to the specific issue of race and racism and highlights the ways. So you get the idea. So that's more or less what it does. And you can go all the way the rabbit hole about that. You can even change topics such as, can you give me a nice vegetarian recipe? 
and I think the guy you can change the topic or you can continue the job the, the topic because the chatbot remembers all of these things. So if I if down the road I can I can always go back and say, hey, remember that we were talking about critical race theory? Oh yes, can you follow up and say and then the guy does that, the, you know, the, the 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 bot can do that. So now he's, he's searching for a nice vegetarian recipe. So I'm yes. just gonna wait. For can you recipe. can you then ask I, it? Can you then ask it if is there a correlation between critical theorists and vegetarians? Oh, that, oh that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> Let, let's see. Let's wait. I want to. I, I, it's you know, it's, it's taking a while because I, at this point there are like billions of people using this at the same time. Okay, there it is. Now, certainly, here is a simple, delicious recipe for a roasted okay. eggplant and tomato salad. Okay, mm -hmm. so can we make a few observations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, let me finish this and then I, and then chat, um, ask uh, Akmar's question and then we we discuss it for a moment. It's just it's just it takes a moment, obviously, because you know billions of people are doing this work at the same time, so it it, it gets tired a little bit of doing this work. We need to give them some water. Come on, I'm gonna give them some water so they can actually you know breathe. Too much questions. Too many people asking questions, but I really want to ask the question. Uh, what was the question, Akmar? Is there a correlation between critical theorists and vegetarians? Okay, correlation between critical theory and theorists. Theorists. Or theorists, not theory. Theorists. Theorists. Yeah. Oh, theorists. that's a good question. Theory. The people vegetarian, vegetarianism or vegetarians, yeah. Vegetarians, because we're talking about people here. Yeah, I guess. yeah. Right? Yeah. Is there a correlation between critical theorists and vegetarian? Yes. We're gonna finish with that uh, question. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, not that we're gonna finish, we're gonna finish the <laughs> exercise. And then we go back to the discussions and then we'll wrap up. Look, there is no coherent correlation. <laughs> 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 critical is, is a theory is a theoretical framework. Uh, while some critical theorists may choose to be vegetarians, like myself, for personal <laughs> or political reasons, others may not. Similarly, while some vegetarians may be influenced by critical theories of oppression and domination, that's a great idea. Others may have different motivations for their dietary choices. In conclusion, being a critical theory and being a vegetarian are separate and distinct identities and may overlap in some individuals, but there is no inherent relationship between the two of them. Okay, so, so before we establish, we move on to the, we establish well, that you are an idiosyncratic case, you see. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I'll show you really quick some other things, but I'm not gonna work with them just so that our audience know, and you know, you can also do poems, like the, 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 the AI, artificial intelligence can generate poetry. You just give them a pronoun and give you that. You can also generate music. You can go there and do some clicks and generate music as well. You can, hold on, let me move this bar for a second. There you go. You can create images. So I can show you this. This is one of my favorite one. This is Mid Journey, which you can create. Right now you don't see them, but so I need to refresh it. There are images here that people are sort of creating. Um, is it, hold on. Um, there, are, I have done created several images here, but it's, it gets busy, you know, like people are like working on this at the minute, but you get the idea. It's, uh, for some reason, you just touch, uh, oh, never mind. You have to go here. It's just because I'm learning, but you go here and then you give them a prompt and it gives you all of these generated beautiful images that for example this guy says super modern office building five floors minimalist or a portrait of an anteater in a terrifying and wild look with an open mouth and then you click there and then you get this and so on and so forth so this with the click of a button so now the illustrators and artists are scared because this is destroying their careers so i'm going to stop the share because i want to hear your uh, comments on chat GPT and the exercise that we did and what are your thoughts? I don't know if uh, Sultan seems like you wanted to say something earlier. Yeah, so um, first of, first reaction I had was um, um, 
what I mean, language, you know, again, I, I mentioned theory of language, right? Um, if, if we are really even looking at language through a systemic functional linguistics perspective, there is this aspect of tenor, you know, which is positioning and, you know, the role of, of um, the speaker or the writer or the reader and, and, and relationships, right? And so, so to what extent are our students getting a, 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 a again, a, a very real, authentic, you know, um, sense of language. What, what the machine, I'm going to say this, <laughs> forgive me, but like to me, it, it feels like this. What the machine keeps spitting out, um, to me, it lands on me as, as academic language, right? With, with um, various complexity indicators, um, really it, demonstrating some complexity indicators there. And so let's say a, a, a third grader starts using ChatGPT and writes the same exact question about Don Quixote. Right, um, we I say in my language, Don Quixote. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> um, so third grader asks the same question as you do, right? How does how does ChatGPT differentiate the asker? You know, the the person who is asking the question and her his positionality, right? Her level of knowledge, her level of processing language. And, and, and how does then ChatGPT kind of respond to that level of, of um, uh, recipients' language use, right? Or language uh, processing complexity, right? I mean, if, if it spits out that same level of complexity, then, then, it's, then essentially the third grader is gonna be lost. Oh, all right, okay okay, Don Quixote was this and all the all these like, you know, a passive voice that was used and all these like complex clauses that are thrown in there. And, and so, I mean, even when I look at this from a, you know, and I wish our colleague Ashling was in the conversation as well. Like, you know, I would, I would, I would, I wonder what she, how she would react to to this from a corpus linguistics perspective, but like you know, looking at it from a systemic functional linguistics perspective, like how how does what's the how does this tool really um, respond to to the the user and the users. Um, level of language use. And I don't mean proficiency level. I mean more like, you know, that, that relationship, right? That relationship between, th that relationship that, that you would expect to see between someone who asks the question and someone who answers the question, right? Even there, there's always this kind of organic give and take, organic, you know, okay, I'm going to, you know, shift and adjust my answer in such a way that 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 my answer gets registered by this third grader, right? Um, yeah. So how does how does how does this this tool do it? You know. Um, so I think I think I come back to the to my question uh, around what's the theory of language that's represented in this tool. And what I see from the limited uh, extent that I that I'm looking at, looking at, you know, I I what I see is is a very sort of um, cognitive uh, view of language rather than 
social perspective of language or sociocultural perspective of language. Yeah, I mean, yes, sorry. Before we get, I yeah, just wanted no, to say you, you can, yeah. no, I was just saying, you, you, you can correct me. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Yassid, you're, you're much more yeah. experienced in this. But my understanding is that actually if it's part of the way that the chat GPT generated the text it did is, is the kind of prompts uh, Yassid entered. So if he had yeah. put in, say, can you explain critical theory to a 10 year old? Then it yeah. would actually change the tenor and it yeah. would write the text for a 10 year old, yeah. right? So, because it can also produce other genres and you can ask it to write a short story. Yeah. Uh, you can write it okay. to write, write a Fair song. Enough. Right, yes. so it, it's part of it is is how we engage with with the with the tool itself. Is that right? You're right. It? Yes, you're right. Like it's again, it's a tool. It's just an instrument, and we decide what to do with the instrument. We we can escalate it. You know, people have created code, you know, to create software and games and you name it. Like it's as big as you. This can be used as big as you want. I could have written. Can you write a one thousand word? a document in which you compare critical race theory and racial linguistic ideologies. And they do it, I've done it in the past and it does it. Or you, as you said, can you, pre let's pretend that you're a, a primary school teacher, you need to teach this to a 10 year old, can you write this? And then it will do it because they, they, yeah. they, the machine will do what you ask the machine to do. And then I'm gonna make a little pause because I need to say this. The, that is on the chat box, on the chat box, on the chat or on YouTube, that Eva made me realize something that I had realized in the past uh, when, when I have this conversation is that I keep saying the bot as a, as a male, like the guy, the guy, the guy, <laughs> you know, as a male. And, it, and it's, it's something that, that comes naturally to all of us as it, every, like this is a bot. We don't know if it is a male or a female, somebody also <laughs> non-binary, which I agree with the non-binary <laughs> of the bot. But it doesn't you know, even apply. Like, the category of gender doesn't apply. That's, that comes naturally. But it's, it's something that I need to keep be aware of that bias that why it has to be male and not a female. But I, I rather call the machine as I think Sultan <clears> has said the machine, because at the end of the day, it's not a human being, it's a, it's a machine. And we need to yeah. understand that it's a machine. It so yeah. Uh, Ahmad, do you is there anything else that you wanted to address based on what we engaged earlier today, or not? Uh, no, let's go on. Let's move on. Okay. Well, let's yeah, because it's been an hour, and I don't want uh, folks to uh, stay longer than we have, and it's important yeah. to also wrap up. I think the last part of the of our conversation today is precisely that question that any of you can respond is: um, Should we educators, researchers, language educators, language researchers, should, be, should we be worried about AI or not? Should we accept the machine or should we reject the machine? What are your final thoughts on what we have engaged? We're, just scratching the, <laughs> we, we're scratching the surface right now. There is so much things going on and lots of conversations and people already doing lots of things. This is nothing compared to what's coming up. Any thoughts, final thoughts? I think, I think you had two very different sets of questions. Okay. Uh, one is how do we feel about you know, the threat or the possibility and what it might do to us? That's one question. And the other one is uh, should we accept or reject it as, as language teachers? So let me answer the easy question first. There's, there's no real rejection of, of things that already exist. It exists and it's available and it's only going to improve and it's going to get more integrated in our life. We're already hearing how you know, Teams is going to integrate it and there will be 40 different languages that we, it will respond to and how it will do so many automated things. So in, in sense of accepting or rejecting, I, I, I don't think that's as much of a question for me. Uh, it's there and we need to sort of learn to deal with it. You know, it's already here. The, the first question is actually one that I'm, I'm much more worried about. And I think when my example with Provence was one of those examples, it perpetuates a particular set of etymologies. It, it perpetuates a particular set of ways of looking at the world. It perpetuates a particular set of knowledge and as being normalized. It, uh, it, it perpetuates 
a view of how things are and how they should be or what they are based on, of course, a very large data set. But then when it presents it, it normalizes it and it presents it as if it knows. And because we are dealing with technology and especially with their students, you know, it, they will think that, you know, it's like, it's like, like with Google or Wikipedia, if it's coming from these sources, it must be accurate. So the, 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 what I really fear is the potential of our students to accept things that they receive from these AI technologies and to accept them at the face value and to turn and to integrate those into their own belief systems and their own ethologies and their own practices. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that sort of scares me because that means in, that instead of the world getting more diverse and more complex, we're going to try to narrow that down and streamline everybody in, in a certain direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sultan? Very well said, Amar. I totally agree. I do agree that it's here. It's not going anywhere. Um, the, the, the answer is we should, we should take advantage of it in ways that feel you know, uh, in integrity with our own um, pedagogical approaches, but um, how does it really interfere with our ways of knowing, ways of living, ways of being, ways of talking and walking, and how does it really kind of then, um, in essence, um, cognitively uh, and, and relationally change um, the way we, we relate to each other. We know how cell phones and smartphones have um, come to, to, in a sense, distort um, our perception of time, our perception of, um, or our, our levels of attention um, span, and, uh, or not level, but like our attention span, our, our um, concentration levels and so on. You know, um, I think, I think that there is a lot of, of space for caution. I agree. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, before wrapping up, I have a couple of things to say. Uh, uh, you know, trying to connect what Akmar and you, Sultan, have said is um, I have a, I had a quick chat with a teacher a couple of weeks ago related to this, and uh, the teacher was really worried about ChatGPT, but not only that, but in general, AI technologies. You know, like mm -hmm. taking over the the world in term at a bigger yeah. level, at a household level. You know, at different levels of society, and this is just the beginning of something that is bigger. So the person was really concerned. And then I asked the question, so we engaged in this discussion about what happened back in the day when the industrial revolution, we were supposed to invent the car because we were supposed to get faster at home and then we could have spend more time with our families. But did, that didn't happen. And then we were supposed to move, we moved from the typewriter to the computer like this that was supposed to do things more efficient so we could have more time with our families, friends, and relatives. And that didn't happen. Actually, in quite the opposite, it speed up the process and got us into this uh, rat race of doing things and being more productive every day. So now people are saying, well, now you have ChatGPT. Well, you just ask them to do your homework and then you have more free time. So <laughs> when, the, when the person was asking me the question, I say, yeah, I think we should have let the AI do what they need to do. And we, you and me, we focus on being human. Meaning mm -hmm. I'm gonna take this computer there, not out of the window, but aside, and because they're gonna do whatever they need to do. And then I'm gonna go and hang out with you by the fireplace and sit down and tell stories and chat in real life and be human. That's what I was saying. So we take advantage of ChatGPT, say, okay, let's ChatGPT do the homework while I'm gonna use this pen and paper and write a nice poem myself. And then I use some pens some um, pencils and coloring pen and I start drawing around and this is my ChatGPT mind. Nobody else can create something like this but me. And then I go and I meet you in a pub or, you know, like in a restaurant and say, hey, look, Akmar, look what I did. This is a nice poem that I did and I drew this, you know. Let's focus, my, my take on this is more about, this is not, we're not going to stop this. That's quite the opposite. But what we can do is let 
do let the AI do what they do. And then for me is how can we as communities find these little space spots and spaces to become human and have more human relationships and learning experiences at the fireplace. So I'm gonna finish with that. And I'm gonna give the last opportunity for both Ahmar and Sultan to finish any last minute thoughts. I will just add to your you. story. <laughs> I, I, I think that is a nice, it's, it's, still, it's, it's still dreaming that we will have time for that fireplace yet. I think that time is going to be, we'll be given additional tasks and other things that we'll have to do and we'll still be as busy. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I mean, really, um, in the, in the most, in the most mindful world, you would, <laughs> you would hope that those fire chat conversations would happen. But, but the, the human condition is such that we are programmed, and we are really conditioned to um, separate separate ourselves from the environment mm -hmm. and from the other quote unquote and mm -hmm. so in that separation um there is a lot of of suffering that happens at many levels yeah i mean i'm not uh, i'm not I'm, I'm not referring to any i mean i'm i'm looking at it more spiritually and mm -hmm. um and and so there is there there is causes and reasons for worry here because these tools and machines can end up being and serving as 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 mediators for more separation like like Ahmar said and and more um uh, kind of reductionist and narrow views of each other versus celebrating diversity of thought mm -hmm. beings and 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 um, language and cultures and so on yeah that's, i'm gonna pick up on what sultan said in the end like it's it's uh, how can we take this to the let's celebrate our diversities in a way that makes sense to our communities and let the ai do what they need to do so I'm gonna finish up by saying thank you to those who attended today in our first capsulas. Um, and uh, some people uh, have been engaging in the chat box of uh, YouTube. Say, I'm gonna say hi to Eva and Michelle, if you're still there. And Zara was there also. The Language Center at the university was there here as well. Uh, Nancy from Colombia as well. Uh, I was here and was we'll here, Cardozo. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. And then hopefully next month, uh, I'll come back again with another topic engaging for all our audience. Thank you, Ahmar, for your time. Thank you as well, um, Sultan, for coming today. Have a good rest of.